Okay, so this evening we're going to look at something called linear momentum and impulse. Uh, linear momentum is an important physical quantity because most of the time you have it as long as you're moving. So if you're moving, you have linear momentum. The only time, the very few times when you're not having linear momentum, that is when you are just lying motionless, you don't have any velocity. So if you don't have any velocity, that's the only time you have linear, you don't, do not have linear momentum so let us to the, so this evening we're going to look at what is linear momentum what it is and what do we use it for and later on in this lecture uh tomorrow we'll start looking at examples of uh, how to use linear momentum to solve certain physical problems A example we're interested in is something called collisions so yeah so what is linear momentum so basically uh linear momentum is or refers to the product linear momentum is a product of mass uh, multiplied by velocity okay so linear momentum is defined as a product of mass multiplied by the velocity uh, why is this important because it tells us something about uh, what how much what kind of motion is happening in terms of not just the velocity of the object which is moving but also in terms of the mass of the object which is moving. For some time, as we have been discussing motion at the beginning, we were ignoring the mass of the object which was moving. Now, when you, an object is moving and you ignore its mass, that is not really a complete uh, treatment of what is happening. So we have had to bring on board the mass of the object, and that's basically what we have here. So when you multiply the mass of that object, multiplied by the velocity of that particular object, what you have yourself is linear momentum. Linear meaning that it's straight line. So this particular velocity is the speed of an object in a particular direction, so straight line. So its speed in that particular direction, that's what its velocity is. We multiply that times the mass, you get yourself linear momentum. The symbol for linear momentum is small p so basically the linear momentum of an object is given by this is simply the mass of the object multiplied by its velocity like that uh, you are multiplying mass mass is a scalar so mass is a scalar you are multiplying a scalar times a vector so whenever you multiply a scalar quantity times a vector quantity the kind of quantity you get in return is a vector quantity so linear momentum is a vector so you multiply the mass which is a scalar times a vector velocity what you get is a vector so later on also uh just be aware that this linear momentum business is a vector so if it's a vector we are interested in the linear momentum in two different directions along the x-axis what's the linear momentum of, ob of objects along the x-axis what is the linear momentum of objects along the y-axis so for us to do that you will have to uh, decompose or you have to break down the velocity bit this velocity so you have a certain velocity then you have to break down this velocity into its x component and its y component once you have the x component and the y component of the velocity then you multiply by the mass then you you what you get is the velocity is the linear momentum along the x-axis if you multiply by the y component what you get is the linear momentum along the y-axis. Y so basically that's how you find out how much the linear momentum is along the x-axis, how much the linear momentum is along the y-axis. You just multiply by the x component of the velocity, you get you, the x component of the velocity multiplied by the mass will give you the linear momentum along the x-axis. The y component of the velocity multiplied by the mass will give you the y, com the y component of the linear momentum along the y-axis so you can find the components of the linear momentum and you can do all these other things which you can do with vectors uh, since you're multiplying by mass and velocity so mass is measured in kgs and velocity is measured in meters per second so linear momentum has got units of kgs meters per second so those are the units of uh linear momentum so why do we need linear momentum okay uh so it turns out that you can actually express uh, Newton's second law of motion, which is very, very important because Newton's second law of motion gives us a connection 
between the mass of an object, the acceleration which that particular object is going to undergo, and the resultant force, which is a force. So in this case, it's also possible to express Newton's second law of motion in terms of linear momentum. And how do we do that? So we start out with, first of all, uh, Newton's second law of motion itself, which tells us about how much, mass, how much force you need for you to produce an acceleration A. So the net force or the resultant force in this case is equals to the mass of the object multiplied by the acceleration of that particular object. Now, if an object is going to undergo an acceleration, it simply means that its velocity has to change. So the velocity at some point has to be, will be u or the initial velocity. Then that initial velocity will have to change to some final value of velocity. And all this change in velocity needs to happen over a certain amount of time. So if the velocity of an object changes, then that particular object, uh, if the velocity changes over a certain amount of time, then the, the, that particular object is undergoing acceleration. So in this case, our acceleration A is just equals to the final velocity minus the initial velocity divided by the time. The final velocity, which is the velocity of the object after a certain amount of time, uh, the initial velocity is the velocity of the object when you start measuring the time. So at the end of this particular time, this particular object should have a different value of velocity than it had when you started measuring. If this is the case, then you have yourself acceleration. This particular object has accelerated. Its velocity has changed. Now, we're going to get this value, this acceleration expression. We're going to substitute it here so that we try to find uh, our net force, which is the force which causes acceleration in another form. So in this case, the net force, F net, is going to be equal to the mass then multiplied by V minus U divided by T. So in this case, we have substituted the acceleration here. So we mod this mass of the object multiplied by V, then the mass of the object multiplied by U, so we end up having, on top we end up having uh, mass times V, then minus mass times U. So M times V and M times U there. Then this whole thing divided by T. Now if you look at what you have here, what you have here are two different types of velocities called the initial velocity and the final velocity and both these velocities are being multiplied by the mass. So what you have here, this mv, this is mass multiplied by velocity, specifically mass multiplied by final velocity. This is mass multiplied by initial velocity. When you multiply mass times the velocity, what you get is this linear momentum. So when you multiply the final velocity times the mass, what you get is the final linear momentum, Pf. And here, when you multiply the mass times the initial, initial uh, velocity, what you get is the initial linear momentum, Pi. So you have this bit, this side is Pf, the final linear momentum. You have got this bit, this side is Pi, the initial linear momentum. So if you've got final linear momentum minus initial linear momentum, basically this gives you, this thing on top here, gives you what is called the change in linear momentum. So this change in linear momentum, now we divide it by how much time it has taken to carry out this change in linear momentum. So what you have seen here with equation seven is that the force which causes an object to accelerate, which is what you're calling F net, the resultant force. The resultant force can be given in terms of how fast the momentum of an object is changing. So basically net force is going to cause the momentum of an object change over a certain period of time. So how fast the momentum is changing, that is what is called the resultant force here. The, the, the rate of change of linear momentum or how fast the linear momentum of a body is changing. So that's what equation seven is telling you. So in equation seven, you quickly notice that if the final linear momentum is the same as the initial linear momentum, if PF is the same as PI, then the change in linear momentum is going to be equal to zero. If the change in linear momentum is going to be equal to zero, then it means that 
there is no net force present at that particular point in time. So if the momentum of an object does not change at that particular point in time, then this net force, F net, or the resultant force, is not present or it's absent. So the net force is only present if this particular object you're looking at undergoes a change in velocity or its momentum changes. If its momentum changes, then in that case, you're going to have a change in linear momentum, which is equals to positive or negative. Okay. The other thing to, get to note is that the change in linear momentum can be positive. This bit, the change in linear momentum can be positive or it can be negative. So we are not, we are not restricted here. The final velocity can be zero. If it's zero, then the change in linear momentum is going to be negative. So in that case, if the change in linear momentum is negative, which is a change in a vector quantity, then the force which is causing that change is going to be a negative force. And of course, time is a scalar, so time doesn't have anything to do with whether it's negative or positive. Are we clear? Okay. Impulse. Well, what is impulse? Well, impulse is basically another fancy way of referring to the change in linear momentum. The change in linear momentum is what we call impulse. And since impulse is the change in linear momentum, we can make delta P the subject of the formula. So what we have here is the net force is equal to the delta P divided by T. So if you make delta P the subject of the formula by multiplying by T on both sides, what you end up is when you multiply by T on both sides, you're going to end up with the net force multiplied by the time. Then this side also, delta P multiplied by T on both sides. So this and that are going to cancel. So we end up having this. The net force multiplied by time times, this is equals to the change in, in what's it? The change in, in linear moment, the change in linear momentum. This change in linear momentum, as you can see, this is what is referred to as impulse. Impulse is a change in linear momentum. Now, how do you get the impulse? For you to get the impulse, for impulse to exist, of course there has to be a net force. And this net force needs to act over a period of time. Okay? So as long time is always present. So as long as there is a net force and this net force acts over a certain period of time, if you multiply the size of the net force times how much time for how long this net force is present doing its business then what you end up having is what is called impulse. As you have said, impulse is a change in uh, linear momentum. So change in linear momentum is given by PF minus PI. So that's what you have there. So you end up having MV minus MU here. So the net, the net force multiplied by time is equals to this guy inside. The change in linear momentum. Then force as units of Newtons Time is measured in seconds, so impulse, you can get impulse in terms of newtons multiplied by second, or just this bit, in units of kgs, meters per second, when what you're actually working out is the change in linear momentum, here. Are we clear? So that's what impulse is. So during an impulse, when there's an impulse, during the time when there's an impulse, or a change in linear momentum, a net force is present during that time, and this net force is going to act over a certain period of time. That's what impulse is. So if you have a net force, then this net force acts over a certain period of time, that net force is going to cause a change in the linear momentum of an object. Okay. Any questions? So with our, what we have looked at uh, in terms of what linear momentum is, how it's connected to Newton's second law of motion and impulse, we're going to look at an example to show how these things are used. So here, uh, an example one, a 15 gram bullet moving at 300 meters per second passes through a two centimeter thick uh, sheet of foam plastic 
and images with a speed of 90 meters per second. What average force F impedes its motion through the plastic? Now, if you look at what this bullet is doing, one, uh, this bullet has got mass. The mass of the bullet is 15 grams. The next, before the bullet passed through the plastic, it had a velocity of 300 meters per second. That was its initial velocity. After it passes through the plastic, it had a velocity of 90 meters per second. That was its final velocity. So you can see that the velocity of the bullet, as it passes through the plastic, changes. It actually reduces. Now, this reduction in velocity is actually an acceleration. This reduction from 300 to 90 is actually an acceleration. So when there's an acceleration, what actually happens if the, the mass of the bullet doesn't change? So the mass of the bullet, 15 grams times this 300, that is your initial linear momentum. Uh, the mass of the bullet times the final velocity, that is your final linear momentum. So your final linear momentum minus, you can see that they're not, they're not going to be the same. So your final linear momentum minus the initial linear momentum gives you an impulse. So when you what you are seeing here is that when an impulse is present, there's going to be a change in the velocity of a particular object. As the velocity of the a particular object changes, it also tells you that there is a net force that is present and that's what we're looking for here. We're looking for the force, this net force, which causes the velocity of the bullet to reduce from 300 to 90 meters per second over a distance of two centimeters. So in this case, uh, the mass of the bullets, which is 15 grams, is of course uh, not in SI units, so we change it to SI units. So the mass of the bullet is 15 grams is going to be equal to 0 0.015 kgs. So that's going to be the mass in kgs. Uh, next, the ve initial velocity of the bullet before it passes through the plastic is 300 meters per second. So our U is 300 meters per second here. Uh, the final velocity of the bullet after it has come out of the plastic is 90. So our final velocity V is 90. So the thing we're going to do is we're going to work out what the impulse is. What is the change in the momentum of the bullet? So in this case, the change in the momentum of the bullet or the impulse, this impulse denoted delta P, is going to be the mass of the bullet times the final velocity of the bullet minus the mass of the bullet times the initial velocity of the bullet. So in this case, the mass of the bullet we know is uh, 0 0.015 kgs. The final velocity of the bullet is 90 meters per second. Uh, again, the mass of the bullet here is 0 0.015 kgs. The initial velocity of the bullet is 300 meters per second. So when you work this out, what you and you should drop your units a bit to make things a bit more convenient. So you have 0 0.05 times 90, 0 0.015 times 300. So you end up having your impulse, delta P, which is close to minus 3.15 kg meters per second. So this is what you have. So this is the impulse. Okay. So this is the impulse which exists during this time. Okay. Next, we are looking for a force, a net force, which causes this uh, bullet to slow down. But for us to find the net force, we need to find how much time this net force is present for. Or basically, we need to find out how much time it takes the bullet to pass through the plastic. Now, we know the initial velocity of the bullet is 300. The final velocity of the bullet is 90 meters per second. And the plastic has got a thickness of 2 centimeters. So if the plastic has got a thickness of 2 centimeters, this is how much distance the bullet has to pass through as it undergoes this change in velocity from 300 to 90 meters per second. So in this information, our initial velocity 300, our final velocity 90, then the distance which the bullet passes through, travels during this whole thing is two centimeters, which is equal to 0 0.02 meters. So here, our final velocity is 90 meters per second, our initial velocity 300, our S is 0 0.02 meters. So we can use this equation. V squared is equal to U squared plus two AS to find out how much the acceleration is. From the acceleration value we're going to find <coughs> then you can use that value to find out how much time this whole thing takes 
So in this case, it's going to be our V is 90 meters per second squared equals to our U is 300 meters per second squared plus 2A and our S is 0 0.02 meters. So if you drop your units there, you end up with 90 squared, 300 squared plus 2A, 0 0.02. So that's going to be 90 squared is going to be equal to 8,100. Then 300 is going to be 90,000. Then this 2 and 0 0.02 is going to be give you 0 0.04A. So you get this bit to the other side and this like that. So you end up having 0 0.04A equals to 8,190,000 and you end up having 0 0.04A equals to minus 81,900. So you divide both sides by 0 0.04, you end up having this A equals to minus 81,900 divided by 0 0.04. So this gives you an acceleration value A equals to minus 2,047,500 meters per second squared. So this is the acceleration of the bullet as it passes through the plastic. The acceleration is negative, meaning that the bullet is slowing down and you can see from the value of initial and final velocity. The initial velocity, the final velocity is much, much less than the initial velocity, which was 300 and the final velocity is 900. So the negative is telling you that the velocity of the bullet is slowing down and that's what we have. This large value of acceleration, 2,047,500 is very large. So it's telling you that the velocity of the bullet reduces very fast within a very short period of time. We, we, sorry, within a very short distance, which is two centimeters. So within a two centimeters, within a two centimeter space, the bullet's velocity reduces very, very fast. That's what the two million is telling you there. So with this two million acceleration, we can use this value of acceleration to find out how much the time, how much time it takes the bullet to pass through. The plastic so you in this case you know that acceleration is equal to the final velocity minus initial velocity divided by the time so we can make the time the subject of the formula so we end up having the time t is equal to the final velocity minus initial velocity divided by a so the final velocity is 90 here we are 90 meters per second squared the initial velocity is 300 meters per second squared meters per second uh, second then the acceleration is minus 2 million uh, 47,500 meters per second squared. So this is our acceleration here. Uh, you drop your units, you end up having 90 on top, minus 300, and this thing here. You carry out this thing, since you have dropped units, we expect our time to be units of seconds, so this is how much time it, ta it takes. So you end up having a time value of 1.03 times 10 to the power minus four seconds. Again, as you can see, this is a very, very short amount of time. So the bullet does not take the whole day or an hour or a minute to pass through or a second to pass through a whole second to pass through this uh plastic it takes a very very short very 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 short amount of time to do that okay and during this short amount of time this is the same amount of time during this duration of time this is the duration when this whole chain this whole impulse exists so the impulse, which is a change in momentum, exists only for this amount of time, this duration. Okay? Now you will recall that, I don't know if you've done that somewhere. You will recall here that if you have your impulse, your change in momentum is also equals to the resultant force, which is present at that particular time, times the time it it's the, the the force is present for and thus you can end up writing this as ft which is uh, f is a the, the force the resultant force multiplied by the time the the resultant force is present for uh, multiplied by the length of time the resultant force f is present being equals to what you found to be the change in linear momentum which is what you have here this minus 3.15 kgs and that's what we have here and for us to find our resultant force f we have to divide by t the time and in this process that is the reason why we have been trying to work out what the time how much time it takes the bullet to pass through the plastic because we need that time to divide we need to divide that time by the impulse Impulse divided by the time is going to give us how much force caused this particular blade to slow down. So in this case, uh, when you do that, 
So we have our resultant force F is going to be equal to the impulse minus 3.15 kgs meters per second divided by the time. And our time is uh, this one, very, very small, 1.03 times 10 to the power minus 4. So when you do that and you drop your units of your cost, so it's going to be 3. Point, uh, uh, minus 3.15 divided by this small amount of time you end up having a force which is equals to minus 3.15 1 1 3.1 times 10 to the power 4 which is just minus 31 kilonewton so this is the force which causes your bullet to slow down as it is passing through the plastic as you can see the force is negative meaning that this force is acting in a direction which is opposite to the direction in which the bullet is moving okay so basically this is an example of how you would use impulse to solve a motion problem as long as the velocity changes and this particular object has good mass if there's a change in velocity it means that an impulse is present. If an impulse, if an, if an impulse is present, it means that you can always work out uh, through one way or another for how long that impulse exists by finding out the time it, it take by finding out the time the resultant force is present for. Then the force, the resultant force multiplied by the time is the same as the impulse. Another thing we want to bring to your attention is the connection between linear momentum and kinetic energy. Now, kinetic energy, as you have seen from our previous classes, is the energy which an object has as a result of its motion. Okay. So, we are going to start with uh, the expression of linear momentum, which is P. So, P is equals to mass times velocity, like this. Uh, then we square both sides. So if you do the same thing on both sides, you have not really changed anything. So when you square both sides, so P squared, this side is going to be equal to MV squared. So MV, the whole thing squared. So we end up having P squared is equal to M squared multiplied by V squared. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to change the transform or change the right-hand side of this equation into something which looks like kinetic energy so that we can see if there is some kind of connection between linear momentum and kinetic energy okay so uh next thing we do is we divide both sides by m so when we divide by m so we end up having m here and m there so this m and one of the m's there will cancel out so we end up having uh p squared divided by m equals to m v squared like that then you multiply both sides by half so you do so inside you're going to have half uh, p squared over m, this is going to be equals to half mv squared. Now this half mv squared, as you are aware from last week, this half mv squared is actually kinetic energy because we have kinetic energy, kinetic energy being equals to uh, half mv squared. But from this expression, you can also see that kinetic energy of half mv squared can also be expressed in terms of linear momentum as p squared divided by 2m here. Kinetic energy is also equals to P squared divided by 2M. So, an object which is moving has got mass and has got a certain value of velocity. That particular object has got kinetic energy, but it also has linear momentum. Then from, that, from the value of linear momentum which it has, you can work out how much kinetic energy that particular object has in this fashion as shown here in equation 12. Okay, so for today, we stop here. Uh, when we meet tomorrow, we will start looking at something called conservation of linear momentum. Now, linear momentum conservation is one of those, it's, linear momentum is one of those physical quantities which is always conserved. And you're going to see what it mean, what, what, what we mean by conservation of linear momentum in, in the instances where things are colliding or things explode. So that's for tomorrow and probably most of next week conservation of linear momentum stuff. Any questions for now? Stuff we have not been clear on? Sorry? Yes? Go ahead.
You heard that? Work energy power. What's the question? Hello? What's the question? Do you have a question? Or you are trying to tell me things? Hello? What is your question? I can't hear anything, my friend. I not, any other person with a question? Yes, sir. Go ahead if you've got a question. Okay. Uh, clearly, there are no other questions, so we'll stop here. Yes, I think your test is next week, Friday, somewhere there. Yes, sir. On the 29th. The other medical students are having their test on Saturday, this week. So you guys, I think it's on Friday next week. Adi? On Friday next week? Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, your test is next week, I think. On Friday next week? Yeah. Oh, I don't know, you're saying I think it's on Friday. 29th, that's what I'm told. You should check the notice board. If you're looking for, or you can ask Mr. Shimba. Yes, speak. Boss, can you speak? All right, we are done. Clearly, there's nothing happening. So, let's meet tomorrow.